We are starting a, a short series on a very timely subject, very important subject. I believe this could change your life forever, forever. This could be the most important message you've ever heard. I mean, who likes to be happy, you know? My wife says that these type of people are the happiest people on earth, and I believe it, and I see it. Often, you know, we see the saddest people on earth and the happiest people on earth, and they have certain things in common, and uh, it's the very thing of gratitude. The happiest people on earth are the most thankful people on earth. And the saddest people on earth are often not grateful. I'm not looking at anybody, just so you know. <laughs> at nobody, okay? They're ungrateful and, and they're always comparing themselves. And I say that the quickest way to depression is comparing yourself. It's comparison. You always compare but there's actually two sides to comparison, you know, as one side can lead you to gratefulness and the other side could lead you to depression, you know, because if you're comparing, it depends who you're comparing yourself with, right? Now, I don't think we have to be comparing ourselves to anybody in order to feel better about ourselves, you know, but uh, instead we could be just incredibly grateful and make it a habit and practice and it'll change our life. And so I want to talk today, you know, this, this first part, because gratefulness has to do with the presence of God. Gratefulness has to do with the supernatural power of God. Gratefulness has to do with faith. Gratefulness has to do with so many amazing things. But today I first want to talk about um, the opposite of gratefulness. And we could think that we're very grateful people until you realize that uh, maybe you're not. And so today I want to talk about how do we know if we're grateful? What does the Bible tell us about that? And how do we know if we're, this, this is a bad word, okay? But a lot of people don't know what it means, and it's called entitlement. Uh, ooh, we hear the oohs and ahs around the room. Elbows are going out, everything, you know. Some people are switching the channel. <laughs> uh, but gratefulness is, uh, you know, you could think you're grateful, but then until you know what, what it is to be entitled, then you don't know. And so I, I have a lot of notes about this, and I'm going to try to stick to this as best as possible. But I, um, I want us to be able to identify what does it look like when we're, when we're being entitled. <laughs> And then you'll be the judge of your own heart today, and you'll be the one to know, you know, maybe, maybe I have some entitlement. Maybe I'm not as grateful as I thought I was, you know. Um, and so in, in just a few moments, we're going to go to Luke chapter 17, but I want to tell you a story, something that happened to me uh, a few months ago. I consider myself to be a very grateful person. You know, I, I, I make it a point to go out of my way to be grateful. And this is something my, my parents instilled in me. You know, every time I went anywhere, they're like, please and thank you, please and thank you, please and thank you. All right? Use your manners. Please and thank you, please and thank you. And so, so you know, we've always been very grateful. And, and then, you know, as I learned more about this, you know, I'm like, Lord, I, you know, I, I, everything I have, Everything, everything good in my life is because of the Lord. So I cannot live a life that is not grateful because the moment I don't, then I'm, uh, I'm acting like I'm self-reliant. I'm acting like I did this on my own. You know, the word uh, grateful and thankful and all that stuff comes from a root word that has to do with grace. And, uh, and it's because when we're grateful... We are pointing and acknowledging something that we didn't earn on our own, something that we didn't do on our own. So when I look at my life, I understand that none of it is because of my own effort. Ooh, do I need to move or something? Um, none of it is because of my own effort. It's all because of him. So therefore, it, it keeps me under that, under grace, right? See, gratefulness keeps you under grace. 
But when you start boasting or you, or you stop being grateful, then what you're doing is you're automatically moving under the law side. Because there's, you're no longer recognizing what came to you by grace, but now you're only measuring by what you or you think somebody earned on their own effort. And so I was in, uh, I was, uh, I've, I've been doing a lot of traveling, and so I, uh, I like to fly direct, and uh, especially when I'm going to Mexico. And, uh, I, you know, I was going back and forth and, uh, and we have a, you know, we have airline points and all this stuff, but we've never seen any benefit from it or any, anything. We don't travel that much to have a lot of benefits or anything like that. But I was on this flight, I had a signed seat and all of a sudden, a few minutes before my flight takes off, I get a text message from the airline saying, your, uh, your, your seat has changed. And I realized my seat changed to row number one. And I go, that's first class. <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, oh my gosh, you know, I don't, it's been years since I've flown first class, you know, and it was because somebody else paid for it, you know. And, uh, and so I'm like, oh my gosh, I get to board first and I get to, you know, sit right. Well, this is awesome. And it didn't cost me anything. It didn't cost me any miles, anything. It's like a complimentary, you know, First class upgrade. I'm like, oh, this is awesome. So I get up there, you know. Well, hello, Mr. Diaz. You know, how you doing? What did you What would you like us to call you? You know, I'm like, oh. <laughs> Thor. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> ben is fine, you know. They um, wrote down my name, you know. I'm sitting there like 30 minutes before anybody else comes in. Um, she comes back. She's like, well, what would you like to have for dinner? I'm like dinner you mean not just pretzels okay this is awesome and so and I'm on this carnivore diet right so I'm like well do you have anything like that? she's like oh yeah we have you know short rib or whatever I'm like oh my gosh this is so great you know um treated like a king you know plenty of room you know because for me like the the seat real estate is very important you know and so so I have more than enough room. I'm like on a recliner. I was like, this is great. Okay, well, wonderful experience. You know, uh, a few days later on my flight back, I'm just waiting and all of a sudden I get a text message. You've been upgraded to first class again. I'm like, oh, I'm like, babe. <laughs> God's favor's all over me. Like, twice in a row, like, I'm like, I've got to check we're not getting charged for this, you know? No, I'm not getting charged. This is co completely complimentary. Walk in there. Hey, Mr. Diaz, how you doing? Well, very well. How are you doing? You know? <laughs> great. You know? Sat down. Enjoyed a flight. Enjoyed a great meal. Look back. They're not getting any short rib back there, you know? It's like, <laughs> sorry, guys, you know? Enjoy the flight. Well, a couple of weeks later, I have another flight uh, again. And flying international, it's only a three-hour flight, but I'm sitting, I'm waiting in the, in, the, in the sitting room, and I get another text message. Mr. Diaz, you've been upgraded to first class again. I'm like, babe, this is three times in a row. I'm like, like, this is just God. Like, this is amazing. You know, I get upgraded. I, again, you know, sit. I have a, a full meal and, you know, personal service and... Ha, 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 how are you? <laughs> you know, just, wow, you know, like you're talking to the people in first class too, and you're like, hey, how are you doing? Yeah, you know, just like, yeah, I'm, I was, I'm here every time. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, had a great flight. On the return back home, you know, I thought, I'm ready for first class, you know. It's got, I mean, three times in a row, you know, this is normal, you know, it's probably, I haven't been flying in a long time to Mexico like this often, so, you know, this is, I guess this is just how it's going to be, praise the Lord. So, there I'm sitting on the, in the, you know, sitting at the gate waiting, uh, no text. <laughs> I go up to the counter, I'm like, hey. <laughs> I said, is, uh, I mean, is there something wrong? <laughs> Uh, 
I'm like, oh, yeah, sorry, there's a lot of people on the wait list, you know, and uh, well, so I'm waiting last minute, last minute, nothing, you know, so they call all the first class people, they go in, watch them go in. <laughs> I guess it's not happening this time. I'm surprised now. Yeah, I'm surprised now that it didn't happen. And, uh, and so, you know, my, my turn to go in, and, you know, it's like group four now. So group four, and I was like, well, I'm going in with my bag, you know, a little bit disappointed, you know, and, you know, walk by the first class, look through all the seats, make sure that my seat's not open, you know. <laughs> I look at them, and I'm like, no, they're all full. And, you know, it's like as if I wanted to say, I belong here, just so you guys know. I belong here with you guys. I don't know what happened this time, but I'm not here. So I go back there, you know, back to row number eight, and I, and I sit down, and, and I'm just like, oh, man, this sucks, you know? <laughs> Coach, <laughs> sit down, barely a pretzel, you know? I'm like, there's no meal. You know, do they not know who I am? I'm like, do they not, like, why isn't anybody calling me Mr. Diaz anymore? You know, what, what's happening? I, I um, so anyways, I sit down, you know, I'm like, all right, whatever, you know. I, it happened three times in a row. This, this is okay. I, I've done this, you know. <laughs> I forgot what it was like, but I've done this. <laughs> and I sit down, and, uh, and I had to go to the restroom. Now, I'm on row eight and out of, you know, 30-something rows or, rows or whatever. And I'm like man, you know, the restroom there is closer than the one back there, Um, but the restroom in the front is for first class only, right? And the one in the back is for the rest of the people, you know, for for the common people, you know? And I've been using the one right there, you know, the last three flights, and, and I remember the flight attendant, you know, because... We've been on these flights quite often, so I know they know who I am. I don't know why they're pretending they don't know me now. But I, you know, I'm like, okay, don't make a fool of yourself. You know, don't go for the first class bathroom because what if they tell you not to? You know, even the Bible says don't go for the front row seat because, you know, it'd be embarrassing if they send you the one in the back. So just wait to be called up, you know? I'm like, okay, so. And so the one in the back was full. There was a line, the one in the front, you know, just right there. It was open, and so I'm like, don't go for it. I said, but the lady's coming. Ask her, right? And so the lady's coming up to me. I'm like, hey, can I just use that restroom real quick? There's a big line. This one's closer. No, sir, sorry. That one is only for first-class passengers. I'm like, did you have to let the whole plane know? So embarrassed. And, um, and I was irritated, you know. And I was uh, sitting there in my seat, just sulking, just like, (sighs) feeling like I don't belong here. Just like, you know, like so entitled. And the Holy Spirit goes, "Isn't isn't it interesting how quick and how easy and how sneaky entitlement can be? What you once, what you once received as favor you're now offended in its absence. I was like, ouch. And we get offended in the absence of what was one's favor. What was a blessing, what was favor, what was grace granted to us, we get offended in its absence. And the Holy Spirit told me, that's entitlement. You didn't earn it. You didn't pay for it. Not with miles, not with money, not with anything. It was favor. And when it wasn't there anymore, you got offended. And isn't that how so many of us act because of things that are no longer there or that were there for a short time or they were removed or, or now they're not, you know, they're just absent and we get offended as if we had paid for them and earned it ourselves. Oh, man, it just got super quiet in here. And the Holy Spirit showed me, that's, that's how you know. And so I, you know, needless to say, the rest of the flight, I just spent time praying and repenting and asking the Lord, oh, I'm so sorry, Lord, you know, uh, that's right. I'm so grateful for the three times that I got upgraded 
But I want to make sure that when that doesn't happen, that I don't lose heart, that I don't get discouraged, that I don't get offended, because then I'm in entitlement. I'm no longer in gratitude. You know, I was quickly getting depressed. I was quickly getting upset and irritated for no reason. Something that I never earned or paid for myself. It was just the favor of God. You know, um, one of the things that we say a lot here in, uh, in Vita Church, and it's one of our values, is we want our ceiling to become the next generation's floor. Right? We want that as high as we go, that it would become the place where they go from. You know, and the, the mentalities of um, older generations is like, no, I started at the bottom, you need to start at the bottom. But that would never allow us to continue growing. And so therefore, our heart, you know, is to say, hey, listen, everything we worked for and gained, that needs to become your floor, and that's where you get to go from, you know? And that's a beautiful thing. But guess what? There's a big problem in there. Because if the next generation does not value or forget the sacrifice and the cost, then they will treat it as something common and they will lose it. You see what I'm saying? It's a beautiful concept. It's how we grow, it's how we go further and how our kids go further and everything. But if we don't do a good job at teaching them the cost, then it'll become worthless. They'll lose it. They will not value it. And so, you know, with the fear of they're not going to value it is why so many say, no, no, no. If I started from down here, you're going to start from down here. And so we have this, like, dysfunctional growth. You know, we want them to go further, but we make them start lower because we're afraid that they might not know how much it costs. And then, them. and so we need to be good stewards of the costs. You know, when... Um, when we don't value it because we didn't work for it, we, do, we don't do what's necessary to sustain it. Amen. Now, how many of you have, uh, have ever told you know, your kids or your grandkids the stories of you know, how you built something or what it cost for something? Right, why do we do that? Because we want them to know it wasn't free. We wanted them to know, like, hey, you're receiving this by what? Grace. And grace causes us to be grateful. Thankfulness looks at the cost behind the inheritance, but entitlement just looks at the benefit right in front of them. You know, Jesus died on the cross. And there's people that look at the benefit. And they take the benefit and they continue on living their lives like nothing else. So they look at the benefit. They go, Jesus died on the cross. Whew, my ticket to heaven. And that's it. But then there's those believers, like I believe most of us, that look at the cost. And they look at the suffering. And they look at the stripes on Jesus' back and they look at the nails through his hands and they look at the crown of thorns and they look at the spear through his side and they look at the blood that he shed and they look at the agony and the pain that he went through and they count the cost. And when you count the cost, you can't help but to live a fully surrendered life. And that's the big difference. Not every Christian lives their life like that. Why? Because some just look at the benefit, don't want to go to hell. Thank you, Jesus. And continue on living a life like nothing else happened. And then there's those that count the cost and look at the cost. And when you look at that cost, you cannot possibly continue living your life the same way. Are you with me? Yeah. Hmm. Let's go to Luke chapter 17. Is this helping anybody? And we're going to read, we're going to start in let's see, maybe verse Luke 
You know, a good example of entitlement was the children of Israel when they came out of the, when they came out of the desert. Um, they kept complaining. They kept murmuring and complaining because they were entitled. They didn't, they didn't know everything. You know, they didn't understand everything. They just, you know, kept that. But that entitlement attitude kept them away from the promised land. I really believe gratitude is the key to increase. Gratitude is the key to being uh, made ruler over the much, over the more. Gratitude is the key to, uh, to fulfilling your call, you know, in, in this life. Gra- gratitude is such a powerful key for everything you want to do in life, everything where you want to increase, where you want, like, if there's no gratitude in your heart, you're going to self-sabotage yourself. And that's what happened with the children of Israel. They were so, they were so complaining about the food that they didn't realize the miracles and, and the cost that it took to get him out of Egypt. They're like, oh, well, we're out now, but, you know, at least we had roast beef back there, and now we just have, you know, manna. You're like, what? Right? Don't you act like that with your kids sometimes? Like, what? You're complaining? Like, do you know there's kids that have no food? Oh, man. Yes, we're going to talk about parenting. You know, we're raising that generation. So are we raising an entitled generation, or are we teaching them gratefulness? Are we teaching them gratitude? You know? um, so if, if your kids complain that you tell them how you used to walk in the snow 10 miles to get to school, keep telling them. Okay, Luke chapter 17, and you know what? I'm going to read this out of the Passion Translation. I'm going to start on uh, verse 11, okay? Uh, It says, Jesus traveled on toward Jerusalem and passed through the border region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered one village, ten men approached him, but they kept their distance, for they were lepers, okay? So if you read Leviticus, you read the Old Testament, you'll see that uh, le- when, when somebody became a leper and they had leprosy, they, there was laws uh, about them where they, were, where they were supposed to live outside of the city. They were like the outcast. You know, they couldn't come close to people a certain distance because they, they, uh, they could be contagious. And, and so there was all these kinds of laws. And if somebody miraculously, for some reason, uh, got healed, they had to be uh, inspected uh, in order to be like, okay, you good, you cleanse, you can return to society, okay? And so these guys, they were at a distance, and they shouted from a distance, and they shouted to him, mighty Lord, our wonderful master, Won't you have mercy on us and heal us? So they knew who Jesus was, right? They recognized him. They heard about him. And they said, would you have mercy on us and heal us? And when Jesus stopped to look at them, he spoke these words. And he said to them, go be examined by the Jewish priests. They set off. Okay. So what happened here is Jesus healed them in a different way, right? And he told them, go get examined. And they believed enough and they knew enough about him to say oh he said it let's go because he didn't lay hands on them he didn't even get close to them in this case he didn't he didn't pray for them and he's like all right just go get examined and so all 10 of them go and they're going they're on the way to get examined and it says they set off and they were healed while walking along the way so they received their healing as they went You know, how many of you have ever received a miracle as you went after the prayer, right? Like sometimes it doesn't happen instantly, but you go in faith and then it happens. You know, we've heard a lot of testimonies. People wake up healed in the morning or they get healed, you know, a few days later or something like that. Well, these guys go and on their way, you know, they get healed. And what do they have to do now? Now they have to go to the priest to get examined, right? And so that's where they're going. But one of them, says, a foreigner from Samaria, when he discovered that he was completely healed, he turned back to find Jesus, 
shouting out joyous praises and glorifying God. When he found Jesus, he fell down at his feet and thanked him over and over, saying to him, you are the Messiah. So he was praising him. He was worshiping him. Right? It says, this man was a Samaritan. So where are the other nine, Jesus asked. Weren't there ten who were healed? They all refused to return to give thanks and glory to God, except you, a foreigner from Samaria. <laughs> then Jesus said to the healed man lying at his feet, Arise and go. It was your faith that brought you salvation and healing. Hmm. It was your faith that brought you salvation and healing. Is it really 10% of people that are grateful? That's crazy. Right? One out of 10 people. That's pretty sad. And this is 10 people that received a creative, miraculous healing that changed their whole life in one instant, right? Because now they were going to be able to return to their jobs, return to their families, return to the city, return. Like their whole life turned around. Only one returned. You know, and I think, uh, I think Jesus did this purposely. Like he purposely didn't heal them right in front of him. Because what would have happened? If he healed them, if he's like, all right, come here, guys, you know, um, gonna, you know, gonna pray over all of you right now, you know, and, and boom, they got healed. Well, obviously, they would have all said, thank you, they're right in front of him, they would have praised them, right? But how interesting how Jesus did it this time. That he's like, all right, go, and on your way, you know, go, go get checked. And it was on their way when they were no longer in front of him, which means they had the option to be intentionally thankful or be like, hmm, well, he's not here anymore, so let's just, let's just go. Ay, ay, ay. I'm not calling you a leper. I'm not saying any of us are like that, right? But do we thank God because we have to? Or do we intentionally go back every day looking for his face and saying, thank you for this and thank you for this and thank you for this. And I love how it says in this verse, it says that he came over and he thanked them over and over and over. And sometimes people complain like, why do we have to sing the same song over and over and over and over? Like, well, if you have to ask that question. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> I think Jesus was trying to make a point of real intentional thanksgiving, of real intentional gratitude, you know? Hmm. What happened is um, nine took the benefit and ran away, but one counted the cost and went back to acknowledge, to recognize, to give glory. And to thank him. I want to read this again out of the Amplified Version. Uh, Luke 17, 11 through 19, Amplified says, As he went on his way to Jerusalem, it occurred that Jesus was passing along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And as he was going into one village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance. And they raised up their voices and called, Jesus, Master, take pity and have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go at once and show yourselves to the priest." And as they went, they were cured and made clean. Then one of them, upon seeing that he was cured, turned back, recognizing, say with me, recognizing, and thanking, and praising God with a loud voice. And he fell prostrate at Jesus' feet, thanking him over and over. You know, and he wasn't a Jew. He was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was there, not, was there no one found to return and recognize? Say with me, recognize. 
and give thanks and praise to God except this alien? (laughs) And he said to him, get up and go on your way. Your faith, your trust and confidence that spring from your belief in God has restored you to health. I love how it describes how he came back, you know. Our praise and our worship with a loud voice and hands raised up and recognizing and thanking. See, that's what thankfulness does. It recognizes the cost. It recognizes, hey, I'm not just grateful for this one little thing. I know that it probably took time, money, intentionality, And a lot of other things to make this happen. And I'm recognizing the cost. And I'm giving thanks. And I'm giving credit where credit is due. Thanks is more than THX. Thanks. It goes way beyond that. Hmm. There's a a heavy heart of gratefulness behind that. You know, and here's the difference. Here's what happens. Um, Well, there's another another thing I'd like to point out is that oh, how to say this? Um. Grace believing Christians sometimes are the most ungrateful kind of Christians. <laughs> Don't shut me down. Listen, you know. Because again, I'm not talking about any of us, you know, I'm talking about <laughs> people in other places, right? Um, but, you know, so that we don't fall into this. And, and I was explaining this to my niece, and, and, uh, and, and she was like, wow, that is so true. And, uh, I said, those people that believe in grace and that understand the, the, the grace of God oftentimes are the least grateful because there's no demand or law put on them. When you're under the law, you have to do, perform, act well, and you know, behave really good, or else you also believe that God will, will punish you or, or do something, right? So because of fe- fear, sometimes men you know, perform better because of the threat of punishment, you know? And so when we're under grace and we understand God's not mad at us, God's not looking to punish us, and that is true, and, and, and Jesus paid for it all, what, what, what he does is he leaves it up to us to choose to be the one that comes back and thanks him over and over and Sunday after Sunday and week after week and recognizes him over and over freely because it's not demanded anymore. See, Jesus didn't apply the law to those ten. He healed all of them. All of them were healed. He didn't take the healing away from the ungrateful ones. They were healed. They were saved. But only one came back. Only the one that wasn't even a Jew came back and freely thanked him and recognized and counted the cost and did it over and over and over. And so I told my niece, I said, that's why it's harder to build under grace because We're not going to put on fake laws over people in order for them to perform. It has to be out of the free will and choice of their heart to serve God, to give, to praise, to worship. Like, they know they don't have to. They got that part really well. They know they weren't saved by their own works. They know their own works are not going to send them to hell. They got that right. But the gratefulness, the worship, the giving, that is all voluntary. It's out of the heart that one decides, okay, I recognize that. And because I recognize and acknowledge that, I'm going to come over and I'm going to thank him willingly out of my heart. 
And see, that's the difference because it's not a demand anymore. We're not under the law. It's not a demand. We get to choose. We're free. And he loves us either way. He loves us the same. He doesn't change. We, you know, we can't make him change. Hmm. Thanks, babe. <laughs> and here's the other thing. There is a benefit, though, for the grateful one. Um, when we read out of the Passion Translation, you know, it says, uh, it says, arise and go at the very end. It was your faith that brought you salvation and healing. Okay? So check this out. The nine got healed. They got the benefit. But the one got healed. He got the benefit. But he also got salvation. And that word is the word sozo right there. And salvation is more than just one thing. It's the whole package. One got the benefit. The other one got the whole works of salvation. So where do we find that? The rest of that. The rest we find it when we come back and we worship Him, and we recognize Him, and we thank Him, and we count the cost every day, and we live a fully surrendered life like, Lord, I know you don't demand it. The nine were out there, they, they weren't demanded to do anything. See, this church, I believe, is full of people that know God's not demanding anything from them. You come because you're like that one. You come to worship him. You come out of your comfort zone to raise your hands and raise your voice with shouts and loud voices and raise him up because you want to acknowledge, because you want to recognize. You know, you, gosh, praise will protect you from pride. Thankfulness will protect you from pride. I can't even go into all the neurological benefits of thankfulness, but needless to say, it's an incredible thing that it does for you. Even to the neuro neurological level you know, of your brain when, you're, when you become a thankful person. I'm sure you've heard Nick talk about it and, you know, about the gratitude lists and, and how every morning you just get up and you start writing down and so many, so many of you have gratitude lists and things like that. Why? Because we intentionally want to go back and say, Lord, I know the price you paid. Don't ever, I, may I never lose the wonder of my salvation. <sighs> may I never lose the wonder of my salvation. You know, um, it's when people fall into entitlement that we face the stupid issues that our nation faces today. Because that's what they are. They're so dumb. Oh, gosh. I don't even hear most of them. I feel like I'm getting dumber by just listening to them. You know? I'm like, oh, there goes another neuron. Just like... <laughs> like, you guys, it's so dumb. And what it is, is a bunch of people that got the benefit and they have no idea what the cost was. And we can look at it at a family level, we can look at it at a nation level, and we can look at it at a kingdom level. There's a price and there's a cost that has been paid, and if I'm inheriting it, I better count the cost or I will lose it. And that's why a lot of them are losing you know, what, what this country has fought for to have and to keep. That's why a lot of them are losing families and, and inheritances and things because they, they don't count the cost. And so, Lord, I want to count the cost. 